All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to Foundations of Business Management 1104 Summer Session 1. It's uh, Wednesday, May 25th, uh, 2022. You may be watching this on Thursday, which is when the modules do. Uh, today, we're going to cover uh, Chapter 1. So we started out with Chapter 2. I'll do a reflect and recap on the key concepts of Chapter 2 in just a moment. Uh, we sort of go Chapter 2, Chapter 1, and we actually jump forward uh, even to chapter four. So the first five chapters from a canva, uh, from a textbook standpoint, a little out of order from a module standpoint, exactly in the order um, as you see them. Uh, I've got some uh, housekeeping things to take care of. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and sort of go ahead and get started for you. Um, certainly if anyone has any questions throughout the summer, feel free to reach out to me, uh, send me an email. Uh, or schedule a meeting. I'll be glad to uh, to meet with you at any given time. We'll you know I do have office hours. We'll find a, a common time or a convenient time for you if the office hours uh, don't best fit your schedule. Just some quick course reminders. Remember to register for Morning Brew. Um, again, that is an email that you'll get at um, usually around six o'clock every morning. It goes through some very very good business concepts, business terminologies as it relates to current events. Fantastic resource um, that we've been using for the last three to four years. I actually like it because it is free and, um, and it's actually written in a 20 to 30 something vernacular. So a lot of the uh, uh, language and tone and tenor, I think that you'll be able to relate with and adapt to very, very well. Um, the other key point of that is just to get you into a behavior of, of, of understanding what's going on in the world around us, whether it's local, regional, uh, national, or global, it gives you a chance to understand uh, you know, what's going on in our business world. You'll also start to see some key concepts and key terms uh, business terminology that's, that's being used there that can certainly help you along the way. And then, you know, uh, maybe not as important, but certainly important for you this semester as it relates to grading is um, there could be quiz questions, questions for quizzes that would come from Morning Brew topics. So again, please do that. Your honor code, uh, uh, honor code academic integrity, be sure that uh, you start that, get that done. Uh, that's a very, very important aspect. I believe that's due next week, uh, so stay on top of that. Team assignments, I made an announcement on Canvas yesterday. Everyone has a learning team. You'll be using those learning teams throughout the next uh, five and a half weeks, uh, including the big project, which is, which is your semester or session, uh, summer session uh, capstone, which is your business simulation. You'll be using uh, the teams for that. Uh, stock market exercise I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, we'll look at the calendar for the next uh, week and a half as we march towards um, your first exam, which is, uh, you know, on Friday, June the 3rd. So very, very important to stay on top of that. I'll do a little quick uh, reflect and recap of chapter two, and then we'll jump into uh, to, to chapter one as well. So your stock market exercise, you can see that uh, that assignment is there in this particular module. Um, first off, let me just say this $500 is hypothetical, okay? So I have to be careful. I, I mentioned this, uh, I think it was the spring of 2021, and actually a student took $500 and invested it in the stock market. Thankfully, they did well, but I don't want you using real money. This $500 is just an example, an experiential exercise for you to look at. So again, hypothetically, hypothetically, you have $500, okay? And the purpose of this assignment is for you to start to understand what the public markets look like, uh, whether it's your life uh, savings or your investment, trying to understand building wealth um, from a personal finance uh, area. Uh, you, may, you may make money or lose money while you sleep, right? So it's, it's an important aspect. You know, and we're gonna do some milestone check-ins throughout the next five and a half to six weeks with regards to your uh, to your stocks and whether you know you went up or you went down, the other aspect of this exercise is to understand the companies that you're investing in. So certainly making uh, you know a good financial investment and, and making a profit or uh, earnings per share 
is certainly a measurement uh, that we all as investors think about. But I also want you to look at the companies that you're investing in and what are they doing? What are they doing with regards to product development? What are they doing with regards to global expansion? What are they doing with regards to sustainability, whether it's environmental sustainability, business sustainability? What's their leadership team look like? Their board of advisors, board of directors? Um, you know, what, how are they um, addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? These are all things that as investors, perhaps we didn't think about 10, 15, 20 years ago, or if we did, maybe it was a small group of people that thought about it. Um, but, you know, now it's 2022, things, have, things are different. And uh, we want to make sure that we're investing in companies that have values that we also rep represent our values and represent what we would want or what we would want uh, asper you know, have for aspirational companies. So definitely think about that. This is a, an example. I'm, I'm just using the example that I had from last semester. You can see here, I purchased IBM. IBM is a, a very old company incorporated in 1911. So I took a company that, uh, you know, is certainly has a, has a strong legacy, strong history, been around a while, but they've had to pivot a number of different times. So, I mean, they started out with, um, you know, just business processing machines like cash registers and uh, retail types. And then they've, you know, they've certainly migrated now, you can see into cloud and cognitive software, artificial intelligence, uh, looking at analytics and integration software. So they've made a number of different investments and research over the years. And again, pivoted at the right time and the right place. So you can see here, I bought one share. Um, at that time, it was $129. I, I, I'm saving this January uh, time frame because I want to look at it in a couple of weeks. And what does it look like June the 1st, right, um, from that standpoint? The next company I invested in was P&G, Procter & Gamble, an even older company, uh, 1837. I chose P&G because there's a lot of brands. And so from a marketing aspect, uh, we're going to talk about brand development and uh, demographics and target audience and uh, brand differentiation and things like that. So I thought it was, you know, very applicable and, and relevant. I, I also think that as we go through this inflationary period of time, how does that impact a company like P&G? You can see here, Bounty Paper Towels, Charmin uh, Tissues. These are certainly things that we need, right? Uh, Tide and Gain, uh, got to wash your clothes. Um, but do companies or do consumers continue to buy these top brands? Uh, but you know, during the inflationary period, or do they begin to retreat? Do they retreat to maybe sub uh, brands? Do they retreat to private label brands? We'll talk more about uh, those types of brands later on. But uh, as you can see here, I bought that one at $161 um, and it has stayed pretty steady. Um, so the whole point of this is you now have hypothetically $500 and where are you going to invest um, and why, why are you going to invest there? Okay, so definitely um, uh, get that done, get that turned in, uh, you know, from a grading standpoint, uh, this is part of your first year experience section of your grades. Um, and let's be honest, it's a fairly easy uh, uh, assignment, a good easy 100, but it has a, a larger impact on your learnings. Um, at the end of the semester, I get feedback from students as part of your reflection on this assignment. And most, if not all students, uh, really enjoyed uh, watching their stocks, learning about the process. And as I said earlier, learning more about the companies and, uh, and why they're Calendar calibration. So uh, we're going to cover teamwork here on uh, for Thursday, May 26th. Again, that's chapter one. Uh, nothing for Friday. Nothing for this Friday. You do have your uh, your team matrix for your Clifton Strength Finders. That's due. You also have Monday off, so you have a four day weekend, uh, which is very very nice. Next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it gets very very busy, right? So we have three chapters: Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Very important for you to uh, spend time uh, reading the chapters, watching the videos, going through the information. 
Um, I will do a uh, review session for exam one, that is next Thursday. And then you have your exam. Your first exam is Friday, June the 3rd, and that's on chapters one through five. Um, it's not my plan to scare you as far as what the exam has, but it is not an easy exam. Um, I always feel like the first exam is usually a wake up call. Um, it, is a, it is a chance for students to realize, wow, I should have read more. Maybe perhaps I should have watched these types of videos. Uh, if we're in a normal semester, perhaps students realize they should have attended class. So again, uh, you know, it's very, very important for you to be aware that it is, uh, you know, it is important for you to study uh, for that uh, particular exam. Again, I'll have a review session uh, to help you. I do plan on some meet and greets. So I think I'm gonna have the first meet and greet this Friday, uh, May 27th, and then I'll have another one uh, next Thursday, June the 2nd. So I uh, definitely want to make sure that if you have any questions, um, you know, along the way that uh, if you're not attending office hours, but you'll have an opportunity to, to ask questions, okay? All right, let's do a quick reflection on chapter two. Uh, this was what we covered uh, yesterday on Tuesday. You know, what's the purpose of a business? And, you know, I think it's fairly intuitive at this point, probably in your academic career, uh, your academic journey of what a business is. But, you know, let's get a, a true definition of it. And it's an activity that seeks to provide goods and services. Um, you know, goods are those tangible products, things that we can touch, feel, whether it's this pen, right, whether it's your mobile phone. Those are things, those are tangible products, um, you know, things that you can touch and feel. Services are intangible. Uh, so, I, you know, whether you're staying in a hotel, which is a service, uh, going to the dentist, that's a service, uh, going and getting your taxes done at H&R Block, that's a service. So those aren't really things that, you know, you can touch, feel, taste, uh, but more importantly, uh, things that do help you along the way. If we get in our first definition of an entrepreneur, we'll look more at this in chapter six and seven. Uh, but, you know, right now, the textbook authors are talking about those that risk time and money to start and manage a business. One of the important areas, again, to kind of get a foundation and a grounding for everyone here is revenue and profit. And believe it or not, even in industry, uh, whether it's you know, and I've been, been in industry before where this gets confused for people, especially perhaps technical related disciplines. Um, but revenue is the, the monies that comes into an organization the monies that are collected uh, based on goods and its services, the exchange of those goods and services. So, you know, if I was to buy this pen at the bookstore, right, I give them the money, that's the revenue coming in to the bookstore, okay? Profit, though, is, um, that is what's left uh, after the organization, the business pays their bills, okay? Or they uh, pay the and accept the cost of doing business, labor, rent, overhead, water, all these different things, parts of cost establishing. We'll get more into fixed cost and operating cost later on in the, um, in the semester, but profit is what's left over. So revenue minus costs equals profit. Now, some of you are scratching your head and going, yeah, I kind of learned that a long, long time ago, especially those that maybe worked in retail. But for others, don't be ashamed if this is something that is a calibration, a point of calibration for you. I'll tell you, 19.6% of you will probably miss it on the exam, believe it or not. And as I've said before, there are, uh, there are industry professionals out there, whether they've got 10 years or 30 years of experience, they still struggle uh, with the concept. All right, chapter, uh, chapter two also had stakeholders and who are stakeholders. Remember, stakeholders are those that can gain or lose. These are people, uh, whether they're in an organization or outside of an organization, that can gain or lose by the activities, policies, procedures, uh, strategy, um, and those concerns of the business that need to be addressed. So some, some examples of stakeholders might be suppliers, shareholders, media, banks, elected officials, uh, community members, you know, neighbors of, a, of an organization. You think here at Virginia Tech, for example, 
some stakeholders, certainly our students and families, faculty, staff. Uh, those are some obvious stakeholders because we're here, we live within the, the drill fields and the confines, um, you know, the beautiful campus that we have here at Virginia Tech, uh, here in Blacksburg or in Northern Virginia. Sometimes we forget that the stake, other stakeholders of Virginia Tech are those that live near here, right? They're, you know, they're right next to the campus or they're uh, residents of Blacksburg or uh, Montgomery County uh, because as, as Virginia Tech does well, so should the county and the town. As Virginia Tech doesn't do well, like for example, during COVID when most of the student body was living elsewhere, restaurants, um, you know, gas stations, hotels, all suffered. Right, they were all they're all stakeholders. So they they lost during the downturn of attendance here in Blacksburg. So it's an important important aspect. So that's the definition of stakeholders. Certainly something that we will cover a couple of different times or a number of different times throughout um, the session. The other part is exploring the world of business, and these are just some functional areas. You there's some other slides the textbook talks about. You know, whether it's operations, management, finance, accounting, IT, marketing, um, you need to understand the roles that these various functions, these activities play in an organization. More importantly, how do they work together? How does each one of these connect the dots uh, to, to advance the strategy, uh, the tactical operations to advance that particular strategy? And so it's, under, it's, it's important to understand the interactions um, and, and then the, the, the other important part of this is for some of you, you're trying to explore and discover uh, perhaps where you would like to fit in in a business. Now, I know a number of you are STEM related uh, students, science and technology, and um, you know, maybe business is a minor for you. And so this could be an area for you to explore how you can apply your main major, your main discipline, uh, into some other areas of business. Uh, it's an important aspect. You know, as, as part of my career, I interacted a lot with engineering. Uh, that was on an operations, marketing, and management level, being on cross-functional teams. And so there is definitely a place for every major that we have here at Virginia Tech uh, to, to have a role in business, whether it's directly involved in a specific area, perhaps like human resources, or indirectly involved uh, where you might be part of a team. Okay. Um, specifically to management, um, management involves planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, right? So we, we refer to that as POLK, a nice acronym for that. Again, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, and looking at the resources. How do we use the resources that we have to advance and meet the goals and objectives of the organization? Um, you know, their managers are responsible for the work performance of other people. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a minute as it relates to, uh, to leadership and teamwork. All right, so now let's move on to chapter one, teamwork and business. You can see the learning objectives here. Very important. Um, you know, I, I, I probably will say this a few times. Uh, a lot of times we flip the page when we see learning objectives. We, we see, okay, bulletized standpoint. Yeah, I get it. Nice professor speak and uh, things like that. But these are good, this is a good checkpoint for you, a good uh, moment to, to sort of reflect on what you should be learning in the particular chapter, especially in an asynchronous uh, mode, you know, modality uh, for this summer session. Uh, typically, you're going to see something, if not uh, uh, a lot, on the exam when it comes to the learning objectives. So don't just flip by these pretty quickly, spend some time, understand them, and be sure uh, you know, that you're learning throughout the, the readings, the slide decks, and or these types of video uh, classes um, that you're getting what you need to uh, from that particular chapter. What I'd like for you to do, and you know, this is where you'll wanna pause in just a moment and, and sort of reflect on it, but I want you to take a moment, you know, take a couple of minutes and think about why teams are successful, whether it's a sports team, an academic team that you've been on in the past, um, you know, an organization, uh, what makes teams successful? So again, I want you to write that down. 
Obviously, what typically comes to mind is communication. So if you have communication on your list, that's great. I would say 99.9% .9 of you will have that. And there's no doubt that's an important aspect. But I want you to dig deeper. I mean, quite frankly, you should have eight to 10 different uh, reasons why teams are uh, successful. So again, take a couple of minutes, uh, pause it here, and then come back. All right, now that you've paused and reflected on why teams are successful, I'd like for you to take the same amount of time, take a couple of minutes. Why are teams not successful? And what makes a team struggle? Obviously, communication comes to mind uh, with all of that. But again, what, what makes teams not successful? Why do they struggle? And I want you to think about that and struggle. Again, I'm going to give an example in just a moment of where, uh, where we think teams can be uh, successful and where they find challenges. Okay, so pause here, take a couple of minutes and, uh, and then restart. All right, so now that you've reflected on what makes teams successful and not successful, that's good. Uh, let's, let's really kind of step back and define a team. Uh, again, a lot of times we think of it, uh, we think of teams from an athletic point of view. I want you to think of it from a business organizational point of view, and hopefully you got, uh, you got this from the reading. The goal here is to advance uh, goals and objectives for an organization uh, using complementary sk skills of, of people. So using diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds, um, bringing those teams together uh, for a market challenge, maybe it's new product development, it's using that unique ex expertise in a very collaborative way, um, allow the teams to make their own decisions and help with the operations. Those are very, very important. Now there's a, there's a difference here and, and I wanna share the example of teams versus groups, okay? So let's use the athletic, so soccer. Uh, soccer, share accountability, must coordinate actions. Think about it. Um, you know, as, as a soccer team goes down the pitch, right, the, go, as they go down the field, um, you know, they have to understand where each player is, where, where is he or she on the pitch, and where, where should the ball be? Now, what's awesome about soccer or even hockey is that, you know, player, if anyone's played this, so if you've played this, I would you know, raise your hand, right? But if you've played soccer, you know it's not where the ball currently is. It's where the ball should be in the future. Think about that. Um, it's not the current state of where the ball is on the pitch, but actually where should the ball be in the next play or the next two or three plays? And that's a strategic mindset of where it should be. Tactically, we know where the ball is currently, where it was before, if we think about the last, the previous two to three plays, but it takes a strategic mindset to think, okay, player one, player two, player three, this is going to be my actions for the next, and that's got to be split second decisions, right? And so think about that, that function then is interdependent, okay? Working together, talking, communicating, shouting, going with what's going on there. So that's a team. A group is a little bit different, okay? Um, so you got interdependence on soccer. We're relying on the other 10 players on the pitch to make the play. Wrestling, again, shared accountability, but each wrestler has to um, have their own performance, right? They, they, they function independently, okay? Especially on match days. Um, and so, you know, by definition, then wrestling is more of a group. Certainly their job performance, a wrestler's job performance adds up, okay? You know, they get points for near pins or a pin. That does go to the team level, okay? But that's more of a group function versus on soccer where the entire team is out there uh, together. So definitely something to think about. You'll start to see how this relates to business um, as we move forward. So again, go back to think, go back to your reflection just a few minutes ago on what makes teams successful and see if this was part of it. So key characteristics of teams, shared accountability. You know, they got common goals, they're working together. They function interdependently, coming together, 
collaborating, innovating, working that typically requires stability. Um, and what do we mean by that? For a team to be successful, they, you, you kind of want to have continuity. You want to have the same people that you there's trust with and there's credibility and you can rely on that in that stable situation. You know, think about, uh, you know, if, if, a, if you know, if someone is out sick, uh, they miss some time, perhaps it's, a, it's happened on some of your academic teams where someone's traveling, whether it's for an academic event or an athletic event, they're out of, they're out of pocket, you can't get a hold of them. That stability then typically uh, brings about chaos and starts to erode the momentum that's there. Teams typically hold authority and decision-making power, very, very important for that to be given. Um, normally operate in a social context. Um, I believe that business, um, as, we, as we sort of um, escape this COVID situation that we've been in and start to get back into some day-to-day, face-to-face social context, that, uh, that I think teams will be much more successful. I think, quite frankly, your academic journey will be much more successful because there's a social element you know, being able to see people, being able to understand their feelings and their emotions, having empathy, um, all of those are important key characteristics of a team to understand that. I'm gonna share a video with you. Uh, hopefully it'll play. If not, you'll have the link for it. This is a company that's uh, based out of Cleveland, Ohio. It's Nottingham and Spurt. Uh, they're now 50 years old. I need to update this, uh, this particular slide over $50 billion in revenue generated, not by them, um, not, not you know, to their top line revenue, but the organizations that they have participated with and helped lead uh, the products and services that they've helped to uh, collaborate on and, and innovate on have collected 50, over $50 billion. Over a thousand patents um, have been gained uh, by this particular organization. So let's watch this video and um, we can reflect on the other side of what it looks like. The project comes from Mr. Spurk, Mr. Nottingham, Pretty revolutionary products there uh, by Nottingham and Spurt. Kind of an interesting story. They actually met 50 plus years ago. 
they were incoming freshmen at the Cleveland Institute of Art and Design. So I always like to share that story because you just never know who you're going to meet uh, while you're at Virginia Tech. And again, they did not know each other. They met uh, in line. They were in line to get their room assignments in their, uh, in their dormitories. Uh, obviously, this was long before uh, you know, the internet and being able to sign up online. So they showed up the first day. They, were room they became roommates. Uh, and then later on uh, created an amazing company. So as we reflect and discuss, what were some of the key words that you heard during that video? Um, and so I want you to kind of think about that for a moment. What were some key concepts, some key words? You know, I always, uh, I always like to, to sort of uh, make sure everyone understands that, yes, I get it. This was a commercial. This was a video. They, I'm sure, had a script. I've been there. I've been there a couple of times. I've actually worked with this organization. Um, may have been a script, but I can tell you their actions are probably greater than the script and the words that they have there. So uh, they are a revolutionary, uh, revolutionary company doing some amazing things. So I get it. Uh, there's always the skeptics in the room that say, Mr. Poff, that was a video that was scripted. Yeah, I get it but I've been around them and uh, they're good people and they make great things. So let's think about some of the key takeaways, the terminology that they use as it relates to business, right? Uh, people, right? solving a problem, uh, making a difference, coming together, that's teamwork, right? So people solving a problem, making a difference, coming together, that is teamwork. Obviously challenging each other on the what if, you know? Yes, we could all sit around and be, uh, be very, very negative. We can always play the devil's advocate and be that challenger. Um, not much is going to get done if you have a room full of devil's advocates. Um, if you have a room full of what if, right? What if? Let's see what can happen. Working hand in hand. Something that we don't really talk about enough, I don't think, in business, and perhaps we should, is appreciation. So appreciating one another, appreciating the differences. And not always agree with each other, but respect um, the differences that we have. You know, understand what those differences look like. Customer focused. So I teach uh, on the, in the entrepreneurship and innovation track. And that's an important aspect is being customer centric, being problem centric. Um, there's you know, no entrepreneur is going to be an entrepreneur if they're not problem focused or customer focused, right? Listening, listening to what those are, being empathetic, obviously creativity, finding solutions, bringing ideas. These were words that they used and you can see the different uh, disciplines, whether it's research, engineering, industrial design, or indoor marketing. So that's a real life example of what you learned in the textbook, okay? Why do organizations need teams? Definitely some awesome examples here. Could be something as big as a, a workplace or cultural improvements. Again, could be that product development. Could be trying to increase margins. I mean, if you think about what organizations are going through right now with supply chain challenges, workforce, um, you know, the unemployment rate is, is down. They can't, uh, companies are struggling to find people, find qualified people. Um, could be something as simple as a company anniversary, right? And being on a cross-functional team to celebrate that kind of thing. Uh, very, very interesting uh, parts. Textbook, this is in the textbook, so I'm not going to repeat it uh, word for word, but you can see some performance improvements. Some of the good examples that I think came out of the textbook here, some pretty large companies like FedEx, General Mills, and Xerox. I always think about FedEx, right? They have one job, pretty much one job to do. Get package from point A to point B, right? You order something from Amazon or you order something, uh, you know, from, a, from an online retailer, you sort of expect it to get from point A, the distribution center, to your home, point B, right? A to B. And um, obviously the textbook talked about the example there they were losing packages. They had incorrect bills. Um, you know, they had 13% error, which means only 87% of the time, 87 out of 100, were they getting it there. So obviously, here was an organization that needed to step back 
and, and realize that their mission, the, the reason for their being in business uh, was not working. They had some issues. And so they had to put a cross-functional team together to make that happen. Some different types of work teams, um, again, outlined in the, in the textbook. So there's the manager-led teams, where there's, you know, the, the leader defines the goals and objectives. Um, obviously, everyone is responsible for achieving those. You know, we, we've got uh, Virginia Tech football. You know, we've got a new coach here, Brent Pry, uh, that's working together. You know, he has to make the final decision. Um, and so that's what a manager-led uh, team like. Self-managing teams, we see this quite, uh, quite regularly in retail. You know, we all have uh, employees that are responsible for different activities and functions uh, within that particular footprint, retail footprint. Um, if you think about it, the bakery is much you know, different than say the produce section. The produce section and bakery is different than uh, what's going on in the, in, the, uh, in the meat section. Your bakery opens at 4.30, produce may not come in until 10. Um, so each one of those has self-managing um, and they have different activities, but at the end of the day, there's still a goal. Uh, so there's a, there's a leader, a store manager, for example, that has um, uh, specific goals and each, each group self-managing team has to get there. Okay? Cross-functional teams, you'll start to see this a lot if you have an internship or once you get into industry. This is where I kind of grew up. I grew up uh, in cross-functional teams, which is fantastic. Um, again, you'll have perhaps if it's a product development team, someone from quality, marketing, finance, um, you have someone then from the supply chain side, uh, maybe sales, um, you know, uh, and then obviously, you know, in that particular case, you may have a project manager, a certified uh, project manager that would bring everyone together, have milestone meetings, have a timeline, uh, you know, holding people accountable uh, from that. But as you can see, all of these are different functions within an organization. Each one of those members of those different functions have a direct boss, but then there's an indirect leader, project manager, or maybe it's the, you know, maybe it's the director of marketing that's pulled this team together to make things done, uh, to get things done. And so um, very, very important to understand this, these cross-functional teams and, and how, they're, how they can be successful. Virtual teams, I think you all get now, I mean, VC before COVID, uh, you know, virtual teams we, we would talk about in class and uh, students would sort of sort of understand, but not not really. I think now that we've gotten through COVID, everyone understands. Used, so certainly used in industry uh, many for many, many years now, uh, and even more so now. So geographically dispersed uh, members, you know, within my career, I was based here in Blacksburg uh, at a company called Tetra, but we had colleagues in Germany. Uh, England, and then on the on the other side, on the east side, we had folks in Japan, China, Vietnam, and so trying to bring everyone together. Yes, we would get together face to face, uh, probably once or twice a year. But in the in the meantime, we would utilize um, you know Skype and uh, Zoom before it was Zoom uh, for virtual teams. Some, uh, some, some duties of self-managing teams. So you can see here, you know, scheduling, uh, conducting training, setting the production goals. But you can also see here, firing coworkers is not typically a duty of a self-managing team, even the hiring of that. That's typically done at a higher level uh, when it comes to self-managing teams. So self-directed or self-managing, again, scheduling teams work, working with suppliers, conducting training. Most can't uh, set the production goals or purchase things or appraise performance um, and along with hiring and firing. Effective teamwork. So again, go back to uh, the start of this discussion and what makes teams effective, okay? Depending on each other, relying to get the job done, trusting one another, working better together than individually, understanding that uh, team members perform better as a group than alone. This, this collective spirit, this collective collaboration um, typically uh, would exceed individual performance. So you know, we'll, we'll talk a lot about this when we get to entrepreneurship 
Um, when an entrepreneur has to decide when, when they outsource certain functions or they start to build a team because they realize they can't get it all done themselves. You know, he or she can get it to a certain point, but in order to scale it, they need to have a team together. And the same thing ha- uh, holds true in a large organization as well. A particular product manager has excellent expertise, has good business relationships, has a vision of where that brand or that product wants to go. It's an important aspect, but they can't get it done themselves. And so the reason then to bring in a cross-functional team so that it can get uh, done. Typically are boosters. Um, you know, I love this from a hokey spirit standpoint that uh, each team, team member is encouraged by others to do their best. If we all do our best, then certainly the, the results improve. This is where also the egos have to get checked at the door, all right? Check those egos at the door. Uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings is if you're the smartest person in the room, leave the room and find a new room, right? You, you want to learn from one another and you want to boost each other up. Uh, if, if, you, if you're jealous or if you find yourself, um, you know, uh, criticizing others, yeah, that's not that's not the definition of boosting a spirit. You know, in the, I was in the military for uh, for nine years, and some of the best times is when our senior leaders would say, "As soon as you cross through the threshold, we don't think about rank anymore. We think about uh, respect. We think about expertise. We think about a collective and collegial environment." Um, and again, check the ego and reduce the jealousy at all times. At the end of the day, team members should enjoy being on a team, right? And that's the that's the goal. If you if you truly enjoy being a part of a team, and being that, then success uh, typically comes about. It's also important to think about leadership and succession planning. You know, it's it's sort of this last bullet that the, uh, in the slide. The textbook talks about succession planning and leadership rotating. Very very important, so that. Uh, not only does the bring in new ideas and, and start to challenge uh, in a respectful way and in a, uh, a forward movement way about having leadership and, and new ideas and things like that. Team cohesiveness, um, I'm not going to go through point by point here. Definitely understand what, um, you know, what some, some examples of team cohesiveness and what that looks like. Now, some obstacles. Uh, so this is where the teams could not succeed, right? There's a challenge. So think about this. Now, groupthink and the definition of groupthink, it's important for you to realize. And I'm sure we've all, I speak for myself, I know I have been caught up in groupthink before on a number of different occasions. Perhaps you have too. But this is when the group is sort of pressured into making decisions. And they just really, uh, they don't necessarily think about or think critically or consider some outside influences. Uh, you know, the NASA example in the textbook is, is a perfect one. I think a lot of times uh, we find ourselves in a, uh, a behavior, an organizational behavior pattern where maybe it's late in an afternoon or, or you know, we want to be somewhere else. And so, yeah, sure, no problem. I hear what you're saying. I agree. Let's do it. Um, sometimes we feel pressured based on a hierarchical, um, an organization's hierarchy. So maybe it's our boss, he or she. Maybe we don't necessarily want to pick a battle or pick a fight. Um, maybe we just say, "Sure, makes sense. You're the you're the boss. I don't really want to rock the boat right now. We'll go through that." And so that's where group think, and it has consequences. Um, with that, it certainly can have cultural, organizational, behavior consequences. If this is practiced on a regular basis, you could see the catastrophe that it caused uh, for NASA and the space shuttle uh, when it came to group thing. Motivation and frustration. Um, and so there's obviously going to be some ups and downs throughout any type of a project. This is where we have to care about one another. Uh, you know, I always say Hokies help. But even in industry, we have to have a collegial um, understanding. We have to be able to respect the differences that people may have. Um, and I think when we do respect and appreciate uh, those types of differences, there's a certain sense of motivation, right? We're all helping one another. We're moving down the field. 
not from a group think standpoint, not just a patronizing standpoint, but true, genuine understanding and genuine respect um, for one another and having those ups and downs. From an academic journey standpoint, you know, even during the semester uh, or during a normal semester when we're face to face, you know, we see someone down, you know, it's putting our, putting our arm around them or just talking to them and say, hey, is everything okay? Is there something I can do to help? And, uh, you know, of course, not everyone wants to share. And certainly there's some sometimes some privacy curtains that that, uh, you know, our colleagues will put up and we have to understand and appreciate that. But a lot of times if, if a colleague or a classmate sees that you care, sometimes that frustration can move more into a motivation area. And then just some others. I mean, we I think we all know that there's just certain people that just have an un unwillingness to cooperate. You know, they wake up every day and their goal is just to make life miserable for everyone around them. And at some point, um, you know, you have to have a heart to heart with people like that. Uh, some tough love. It's not going to be easy. Um, but we I think we all know probably at least one or two people that are that way. I would say rather than um, kicking the can down the road and avoiding those types of frustrations or those types of meetings, it's based just to, uh, you know, have a meeting face to face and and talk through it. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but in the end, it makes a big difference. Okay. Skill sets. Every team, uh, you know, has a, a mixture of skill sets, whether that's technical skills, decision making, and problem solving, or interpersonal skills. Now, we're, we're going to talk more about interpersonal skills throughout the the session, the summer session. You know, that's being able to resolve conflict, like I just mentioned in the example. Maybe it's listening, you know, skills in listening, you know, I always say it's learn to listen, you know, so being able to you know, have an open mind, a clear mind, an unbiased mind, that's the learn to listen. And then it's listen to learn, right? And so that's having that empathetic understanding, hearing what people are saying, um, you know, taking notes, reflecting on that, asking deeper questions. You know, once they're done, those are those are strong interpersonal skills. I'll, I'll tell you, that's what recruiters are looking for, because it's not just an age thing or a, um, you know, not, not necessarily a generational thing. It's quite frankly, I think, a societal situation where we just don't listen to one another. Uh, I mean, a great example is up on Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. People aren't listening to each other. They love to hear themselves talk. They're not necessarily listening to uh, their colleagues, whether in their own party or across the aisle. And even in organizations, sometimes companies will, you know, be in a siloed situation where the, you know, finance may not be listening to marketing and marketing may not be listening to operations. And so it's important to have those, those types of, um, of, of good interpersonal skills. Okay. This is where your strength finders comes into play. Right. So this is the connecting of the dots. Why do we do strength finders? It's so that you understand who you are. Right. It's, and that's a moment in time for sure. And really, you know, kind of focusing more and valuing more and investing more in your strengths. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a stand, you know, an opportunity to say these are my strengths. Now I've got all these weaknesses. It really is to understand what your strengths are and spend more time practicing those strengths. And. And so, for example, if you have Wu, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, to, to lead others and motivate others, you know, invest more in that. You'll be surprised uh, what that looks like. Or maybe one of your strengths is from an organization standpoint. You know, if, if I was to look in your closet, is your closet organized, you know, all your shirts, you know, like, for example, in my closet, all my blue shirts, my white shirts, my maroon shirts, my orange shirts are all laid out that way. Just, just the way it is for me uh, from an organ. So understanding what our strengths are and, and, and really practicing more and investing more in that. Some team member roles. Um, this is outlined in the textbook. Understand that depending on the situation, you have to be aware and understanding in your team um, you know, again, whether it's this session, this summer session, or in the future in an academic or in industry term, you may have to play different roles depending on the situation or depending on the skills gaps that are in, on a particular team. That's, that's good leadership. It's called situational leadership. 
in understanding, for example, it might be a relationship building. Okay, you may be uh, you know you may be visiting a supplier with another colleague or two, and uh, depending on that particular uh, visit and what the goals and objectives are that that visit, you know, you may be the person that's trying to build the relationship uh, versus, you know, perhaps before the meeting, uh, someone had to take on the task facilitating, right? So understanding when those assignments are due, uh, you know, navigating through the uncertainty and the ambiguity and what are the firm dates, what does the project timeline look like? And so those are just some examples. Um, now, a negative one is blocking, you know, and so this is just behavior that looks like stalling or deflecting or presenting opinions if they were facts. Um, this is a very frustrating part. Uh, it can be uh, dysfunctional. This is where a leader and or leaders or members of the team have to step up and just say, listen, uh, you're destroying the morale, you're, you're hurting consensus building, you're creating conflict, it's not acceptable. Again, these are these sometimes are people that they're just, this is their DNA. This is who they want to be. And it's not healthy for an organization. It's typically toxic um, and can, quite frankly, destroy the morale uh, within organizations. Um, and so certainly understanding what that looks like. Now, certainly people should have the chance to challenge leaders, challenge the organization, I mentioned earlier, you know, the devil's advocacy. Sure, there's moments and there's times when that should be a part of it. But there's a difference between being respectful and then a, a, a true deflection, right? Or just bringing up opinions and, and really kind of casting those opinions as if they were facts of an organization. Um, and so what sometimes happens with that when, when people bring up these opinions, then it takes time to to negate that, um, and, and that's just not healthy for an organization. Now, this is SHRM, uh, Society of Human Resource Management, um, you know, based out of Washington, D.C. So this is professional uh, human resources uh, or human resource professionals that have, have been surveyed on why do teams struggle. So again, compare this to the reflection that you did at the beginning of this video and think about it. Um, does this match up with what your thoughts were, right? So typically teams struggle because of relationship issues. Maybe, maybe they don't understand their roles and responsibilities. Um, you know, who are they? What are they about? What are they supposed to get done? Um, and that sometimes can be because the leader has not defined the roles and responsibilities or perhaps the goal. There needs to be a clarification on the goal. Um, and so it's an important part to understand. And so we share this, we talk about this, um, but more importantly, we, we want to see how do we negate, how do, how do we mitigate these types of struggles? And if we know that these are struggles that, you know, here have been validated by the Society of Human Resource Management, this would be, this would be what we would take into a team development. So let, you, you just have been assigned a team. This is going to be your team for out throughout the semester. And so you start to say, okay, lack of trust. That is a struggle of teams. How do we build trust amongst one another, right? We lack goal clarity. Okay, what is our goal for a particular assignment? What's our goal for a particular project? And understanding that at the beginning and start to build on mitigation strategies, then certainly you're trying to reduce the struggles and increase the probability of success, right? So Pamplin, Virginia Tech, right? Why so many team projects? Why do we bring uh, this academic journey? Why do we bring teams into it? Well, you can see here a survey of Fortune 1000 companies, right? 79% utilize self-management teams. 60% of career failures, right? 60%, six out of 10. Uh, of career failures are because people have a uh, struggle. They have an inability to work in teams for whatever reason. They either choose not to, uh, maybe they, you know, they feel like they're the smartest person in the room and everyone should listen. It, 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 there could be, uh, you know, infinite number of reasons for that. 91% of these Fortune 1000 companies utilize some type of team. So, you know, one of the 
best employee skills, right, is a proven ability to work in teams. Uh, very, very important. So the class team projects, you know, um, these are just some examples of how teams can, can work together. Um, I think these are some things that you need to follow, whether it's in this course or in other courses. It's part of that. You know, leading a team, think about what we are expecting from leaders. What do we expect from a leader? Certainly integrity, clear and consistent, positive energy, common points of view, understanding diversity, being able to manage agreement and disagreement. There's there's definitely going to be disagreement. We can't think that everything's going to be rosy and perfect. And when that disagreement arises, what is the kind of culture that the leader and the teammates go through? How do they, you know, come to a consensus? And if they don't come to a consensus, that's fine. Certainly they should leave the room or leave the meeting uh, with a sense of respect for one another. Uh, with that. You know, being able to motivate members to look at uh, new and uncertain situations. So being able to encourage one another, coaching one another, sharing information. This gets down to trust, trust, credibility, and rapport. So being able to check in on teams on a regular basis, sharing that information um, and being a part of it. Okay. So I'm going to stop here uh, and finish up uh, today. And certainly if you have any questions, um, you know, on this particular chapter um, or if you have questions on any of the modules, please feel free to reach out to me. And I hope everyone is enjoying the, their summer session so far as we are at the end of May. And uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. Take care.